This morning we had an interesting conversation in the car as a family. One of my children, who shall not be named, said from the back seat, I like church, but not that much. <laughs> and you know, as a parent, you hear something like that and you're all alert. Say, really? Why is that, buddy? He said, because we sit for a long, long time. And I said, yeah, especially when daddy's preaching, huh? <laughs> and that child responded, yes, yes, of course. <laughs> uh, became an interesting opportunity to share with the family, remind uh, my children, and even my own heart, about the, the blessing of preaching, even long preaching, uh, you know, to hear God's word again afresh is really a privilege. It is a privilege. Preaching, preaching, <laughs> and hearing preaching is a privilege, and, and we went on to, to actually talk about it. I, I mentioned to the kids, you know, there was a time in history and places currently where they don't hear preaching. They don't get preaching. And just thinking about, you know, the Middle Ages, God's word is uh, not understood, not readily available, to the masses, to the common man. It's dark times. And so just, it was a, a good reminder for my own heart, even as we had that brief conversation, that to hear God's word heralded, uh, and of course to be the one doing the proclaiming, it really is a, a benefit and a blessing. And that's, I mean, that's, so much of what we do here. Time and time and time and time again, we are in, in danger, frankly, of getting bored or this becoming commonplace. And uh, I just, my prayer this morning is that we don't get bored, that we don't get tired of preaching, of hearing God's word opened and hearing truth again and again and again, and that we even come with an eagerness to hear it. And so let me, let me just open our time with prayer, and we'll look at Haggai one last time this week. God, it's a privilege to have your voice, to hear your voice, and we do hear you every single time the scriptures are opened. We hear you firsthand when the scriptures are opened um, and we can hear you audibly if we read it aloud, which we so often do. Uh, such a treasure to have your word given to us in all of its splendor and clarity and authority and relevance, even as we, we look at this ancient book of Haggai. Uh, it was certainly applicable to the audience then, and yet we've seen week after week what import it has for us. And so even now, I pray, God, that you would uh, give us ears to hear, give us eyes to see and hearts to understand, minds that are open and just pliable under your, your, your word that your powerful voice would meet with receptive hearts in us and that all together, not merely uh, as individuals, but all together, this congregation of, of saints, people you've called out and gathered together in this body would be eager to respond to the truth that we find here in what you've said. And we ask all these things in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. We are going to end Haggai today. Uh, I want to begin, though, with 
directing your attention to Ezra chapter 6. Ezra chapter 6. Ezra being a contemporary of Haggai as well as Nehemiah. (laughs) These books are so helpful in giving us the narrative context to add alongside the prophecy. And here in Ezra 6, we're just given a, a glimpse of the people's attitude, what was happening when these prophets, Haggai and Zechariah most notably, were doing their prophesying. When they were preaching, when they were ministering to the people and serving them. Here is what Ezra, the scribe, the priest, he records in Ezra chapter 6, starting at verse 14. And the elders of the Jews were building and succeeding through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edo. So they built and completed it according to the decree of the God of Israel and the decree of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And this house was brought to completion on the third day of the month Adar. It was the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. Just as a a backdrop to everything that we'll see in closing in Haggai, note a few things that, as, as what I just read says, the work was completed in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. We are four years before that, in the second year of the reign of King Darius. And so it's still a while before this work is completed when Haggai's prophecy, the, the written portion of what he said, actually ends. But also in verse 14, just note that they were building and they were succeeding specifically through the prophesying of these two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah. The point is that the, the building came to completion, the obedience was carried through to fruition because of the prophets who prophesied among them. As the people labored, the prophets prophesied. And with that, I want you to turn to Haggai, and I'll read the final portion of this message. And we'll see a final word that strengthened this people, that strengthened the remnant in their work of rebuilding the temple. What did Haggai say that was so powerful, in addition to what he's already said, that would compel, that would motivate, that would move the people to carry on with this work? And that's what we'll encounter in this final portion of the, of the prophecy. Haggai chapter 2, starting at verse 10. This took place On the 24th of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, the word of Yahweh came to Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, Ask now the priests about the law. If a man carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches bread with his fold, or cooked food, wine, oil, or any other food, will it become holy And the priest answered, no. Then Haggai said, if one who is unclean from a corpse touches any of these, will the latter become unclean? And the priest answered, it will become unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, so is this people, and so is this nation before me, declares Yahweh, and so is every work of their hands. And what they bring near to me, there is unclean. But now, oh, set your heart to consider from this day onward, from before one stone was set on another in the temple of Yahweh, from when it was that one came to a grain heap of 20 measures, 
then there would be only ten. And from when one came to the wine vat to draw fifty troughs full, then there would be only twenty. I struck you and every work of your hands with scorching wind, mildew, and hail. Yet you did not come back to me, declares Yahweh. O oh, set your heart to consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day when the temple of Yahweh was founded or built, set your heart to consider, is the seed still in the barn? Even including the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree, it has not borne fruit. Yet from this day on, I will bless you. Then the word of Yahweh came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow the thrones of kingdoms and destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations. And I will overthrow the chariots and their riders and the horses and their riders will go down, everyone by the sword of another. On that day, declares Yahweh of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, my servant, declares Yahweh, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares Yahweh of hosts. This book comes to a marvelous close and really shouts to us, even as modern day readers, that surpassing blessing, abundant surpassing blessing, is coming to those who fear God. This is a glorious and great way to end this book. As I just read, there's a, a, a note specifically for one man in particular, Zerubbabel. But even before that, we get another good word to the remnant, the people of Israel, and together, the book ends with a climax as a way of reminding these readers, these hearers in Haggai's day, as well as all subsequent readers and hearers of this prophecy, that surpassing blessing is coming to those who fear God, those who obey him from a heart that fears the Lord. Blessing beyond their obedience is indeed coming in the near future and in the nearer future. We'll see that in our text. Here's how I'm summarizing the point of what we have here is that God's final word to strengthen the remnant in their work, it includes two parts. God's final word to strengthen the remnant in their work includes two parts. And those two parts are God's promise to his people, his promise to his people, and his plan for Zerubbabel. His promise to his people and his plan for Zerubbabel, though you should not import yourself directly into the text as the one receiving the good word yourself, it still has application. It still has incredible relevance to us today. And so these two things are going to be an incredible encouragement if you understand them rightly. So this first part, his promise to his people in verses 10 all the way through 19. This is introduced with the arrival of the word in verse 10. The arrival of the word. On the 24th of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, we've seen this before, this sort of introductory formula that gives us a day, a month, a year, a specific time in history where God invades human history. And as he speaks through his man, this is what he says, the word of Yahweh came to Haggai, the prophet, quote, and then we get the content of the prophecy. So in the arrival of the word, we have the date it arrived, a specific date. By our calendar, this would have been December 18th. 
and this would have been middle of winter in Israel, right after all of the rains had come, the ground was soft enough to plant in, and the seeds had been implanted. That's when the word comes. No accident, no coincidence. Again, we see a timely word, specifically planned by God for his own purposes, to strengthen his people when he speaks. And on this December 18th date by our calendar, it says the word of Yahweh came to Haggai, the prophet, saying. And so besides the date that it arrived, we also just need to slow down and look at a few details here, specifically the way that it arrived. The way that the word arrived when it came. Just note first, like all the other times, it was the word of the Lord. All caps, the word of the Lord, the word of Yahweh, that personal covenant-keeping name of God is what we read here. And so the way it arrived was first off from God. It does not say the word of Haggai came. Was it Haggai's words? Absolutely. But it was Haggai's words because God put them in his mouth. These were the words of the Lord. So these were from God. These were from God. Notice in verse 10, they were to Haggai. As we keep reading, we find out that they're for the people, but they're for the people specifically, as verse 11 notes, through the priests. So you have a word coming from the Lord to Haggai, He says, go ask the priests something. And then when this word comes to the priest, as it's filled out, we find out the content is actually intended for all the people. From God to Haggai for the people through the priests. And before we move on, just notice the astounding, almost uh, subtle but implicit bibliology that we get just in verses 10 and 11. Bibliology, the study of the Bible. What does the Bible say about itself? And just notice the uh, implicit characteristics that are here in Scripture and what it says about the word of the Lord when it comes. The word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet saying, thus says Yahweh of hosts, Ask now the priests about the law. Now let me fill this out. In this, we get the qualities of God's word, which is essentially the qualities of the scripture. When God speaks, whether that is him speaking audibly like he did in scripture, or when he speaks in the written word, they're both equally God's word. What's true of one in its nature, in its essence, in its quality, when he speaks audibly, is true of the other. When those words take shape on scripture, on page. And so just notice that this word from God came with authority. Verse 11, ask a command, an imperative. It came with authority. When the word came to Haggai, it got to tell Haggai what to do. That's authority. When God speaks, it's authoritative. The word also came with clarity because in the ensuing conversation, not only does Haggai get it once God speaks, God doesn't have a speech impediment. He doesn't have to repeat himself. Haggai understands. It's clear to him. So when he repeats it to the priests, They have a conversation. They have this back and forth. That's clarity. Human beings, when God speaks, even through a human vehicle, they can respond because God speaks clearly. The word came from God with authority and with clarity. And because God didn't have to speak again, for them to obey, that implies that it was sufficient. It was enough the first time that he spoke. 
It has authority, clarity, sufficiency. And just notice that in verse 11, when he speaks, ask now the priests about what? What does it say? About what? The law. God speaks this new word to his prophet for a current day audience, and he is so consistent in what he says that he can point all the way back to Moses. Some 900 years ago, and he can reference his word even back then because it was consistent. And so the same word that he spoke back then was readily available, understandable, sufficient, authoritative for even the new audience. And that's what we call an enduring word. Psalm 19, the fear of the Lord abides forever, right? So this abiding word, it's authoritative, clear, sufficient, consistent, enduring. All of that's not explicitly stated, perhaps, but it's implicit, it's implied in how the word just comes. It's great. Love your Bible. It speaks with authority because God is speaking. It speaks clearly because God is speaking. It's speak sufficiently to everything it says because God is the all-sufficient God who is speaking. And so when this word comes, it's received as, as such. And again, it comes to Haggai, but for the people through the vehicle or the medium of the priests. Now, why not just tell the people? Why not gather the people together and just tell them? what God says. The Levites, the priests, it's helpful to remember, they were supposed to be the teachers of the people. This is why they didn't have a tribal allotment. It's one reason. Instead of having a tribal allotment and putting all the Levites, all the priests who had the duty to be most familiar with the law so that they could teach the people, they didn't want them all gathered, siloed in one place. They were scattered throughout the cities of Israel. So wherever the tribes found themselves, they were supposed to have Levites among them, reminding them of the word, teaching them of the scriptures, impressing it on the people to submit to God. And so here again, God, I think, reestablishes or is furthering that pecking order. The priests are the ones who are going to be the instructors of the people. So this word is going to be given, addressed specifically to them, and they're supposed to disseminate this among Israel. And so he calls for an audience with the priests. So this promise to the people not only details the arrival of the word, but the addressing specifically of the priests. And that's verses 11 all the way through the end of this section in verse 19. The addressing of the priests. The priests are addressed, verse 11, ask now the priests about the law. He makes a case in, beginning in verse 12. By way of illustration, he asks these men most familiar with the law. Ezra would have been among them as a priest, one who set his heart, to study the law, to obey it, and to teach it. He would have been in this group of men. And then it's just plain. So he makes first a case that holiness is not transferable. That's what we see in verse 12. And he just, this would have been so obvious to them. The answer's clear. If a man carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches bread with this fold, or cooked food, wine, oil, some other food, then does that other food, that other thing that it touched, become holy? No. <laughs> That's not how it works. When God established the law in the beginning, holiness was not transferable in that way. So you could, you know, 
okay, this meat that was dedicated to the Lord, set, a, set apart, a, a Levite could grab that and rub it on stuff, right? Make everything holy. That's just not how it works, right? I've touched it and now everything else becomes holy. I put it in my clothes. Now those other things become holy if my clothes touch it. That's just not how it works. And so the answer is just simple and clear. They respond in verse 12, no, it's not how it works. He's driving at something with all of this. He's building a case to make the point that he eventually comes to it at the end of this section when he finally pronounces this blessing, assures them that of his blessing. But this is the path he takes to get there. So no, holiness is not transferable. But there's another side of, of this coin as well. And here's the second case to be made that uncleanness does defile. Though holiness is not transferable, uncleanness does defile. And that's verse 13. Then Haggai said, if one who is unclean from a corpse touches any of these, so now something like a corpse that is inherently unclean, if it has touched something, namely a person here, and then the person touches these other things, is the uncleanness transferable? And the answer is yes. Those things that get touched by what was touched <laughs> that was unclean, the person became unclean by touching the corpse, and now everything that he touches becomes unclean. And then on and on, the people who touch that thing become unclean. So there's this trickle-down effect when it comes to defilement that does not apply in the same way to holiness. Just in principle, the argument that he's making, he's reminding them that holiness doesn't get transferred from, from one thing to another just by association, right? You're not holy because you show up here every Sunday. It doesn't work like that. You're not holy, children, because your parents believe God. Unbelieving spouses are not holy unless they too believe like their believing spouse. Holiness is not transferable. Because you go to build in Wellspring, because you've taken the trust, digging deeper, Right? All of the training and, and wonderful equipping opportunities available at Grace Bible Church. That doesn't mean the outcome is a godly individual. It's to the extent that you actually own those principles for yourself. You own those convictions and then you put them into practice in your life. To that degree, you become pleasing to the Lord. But not just the association. You, you get this. The contrast, though, you take someone who is unclean, unclean motives, an impure heart, wrong desires, insincere words, or a practice, a walk in, in that person's life that's hypocritical. That person is unclean, defiled. And so the things that he puts his hand to the deeds that he does, what comes out of him, his practices, can any of those things be clean? The answer is no. Absolutely not. And this is, after he makes the case, why he, in verse 14, introduces the comparison. Then Haggai answered, verse 14, and said, so now they've been answering, the priests, they answered no, they answered yes, it will become unclean. Well, now he's going to answer and make the comparison then. So is this people, and so is this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so is every work of their hands, and what they bring near to me there is unclean. The point that God's making is you've been rebellious, you've been hard-hearted up until this current season, 
And so the things that you've been laboring at with your, with your inverted priorities, <clears throat> the building of your own houses that we saw in chapter 1, you've completed your own houses, you've undertaken to make sure that you're comfortable in the land, and all of the various pursuits that you've gone after up until this current season, they don't count. For, for good works, for real fruit. And so as a people who, again, until recently has not been fearing the Lord, has not listened, have not obeyed him, then everything that they've put their hands to is considered before God unclean. And you could have had someone hearing that, when the priest went back and told them, here's the divine perspective on what you've been doing the past 16 years. And that person in their heart could have risen up and said, but God, I, they would have been at a crossroads at that point, and they could either agree with God or insist on their own understanding. They could have been wise in their own eyes and said, but when I think about the things that I've been doing, they seem okay to me. All the times that I've been kind to people, loved my spouse, parented well, but God is telling them it's all unclean. None of it has been acceptable. Let me just remind us why this is the case. In chapter 1, Verse 12, <clears throat> remember that it was only after the rebuke came, after this initial rebuke, admonishment from Haggai, that Zerubbabel, Joshua, and all the remnant of the people, verse 12, did two things. They listened, that is, to the voice of Yahweh their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as Yahweh their God had sent him, and feared. The people feared the Lord. It was at that point that they listened and feared the Lord. So listening and fearing the Lord, that the, the Hebrew word for listened or obeyed, and fear God. The, the, the idea here is that they have practiced now, they have turned toward God-fearing obedience. Any attempt at obedience minus the fear of God is not obedience. It doesn't count vertically. Before God, it does not count. It might do the world good. Right? You have unbelieving philanthropists give away millions of dollars. Are we to say that's not good? Well, de depends what you mean. Before God, absolutely not. God hates their self-righteous philanthropy. When we, Christian, go about seeking to do what God commands with a divided heart, with self-serving motives, right? If I, as a husband, said, I'm going to love my wife because what I love most is peace at home, does that please the Lord? No. No. I love peace more than God, and so I keep my wife happy, seek to serve her. That's not God-honoring. That's something of the idea of what was happening until verse 12 occurred in chapter 1. Until they listened and feared the Lord, lay hold, laid hold of God-fearing obedience— then nothing that they put their hands to was pleasing to the Lord. But remember, this is happening now. In this season, in Israel's life, among the people from the leadership down, they have turned to the Lord in God-fearing obedience. And so in verse 15, we get a turn. But now, so there's this contrast. Okay, that's been the case up to this point, but now... 
set your heart to consider from this day onward. And this is repeated, verse 15, and then twice in verse 18, this same command, set your heart. Set your heart. The same command, let me remind you, occurred in chapter 1, verse 5. Set your heart upon your ways, chapter 1, verse 5. And then again in verse 7, set your heart upon your ways. So five times in this book, we get a clear command to do something with the inner self, the inner life, the real you that nobody can see, nobody can hold, touch, taste, smell, feel. What to do? Set it. It's a determined fixation to do something. Put it in place is the idea. Because of the, the repetition of, of this command, I want you to note the timing of this. The first time the command came in chapter 1, verse 5, and in verse 7, this was before their God-fearing obedience took place, right? They were told, set your heart. Before they had ever Repent it, turn to the Lord in repentance, to fear him and listen. They were told, get your heart in order. Direct your heart in the way, to use Solomon's language in Proverbs 23, 19. Or Proverbs 4, 3. With all vigilance, watch your heart. Keep your heart. Guard your heart. Set your heart. Before repentance, this is the primary work. Set your heart. Give attention to your heart. Well, now that they've turned to God, they are a God-fearing people. Uh, He's called their God now. God calls them the people of the land. And they're actually obeying. Great. We have given attention to our heart properly. We've turned back to God. And we're already obeying. We're we're continually obeying. And what does God call them to do again? The very same thing they did before repentance. Set your heart. Set your heart. This is a great reminder for us. God-fearing obedience is not like a destination that we arrive to. You know, like when you go on vacation— It takes a lot of work to get the family packed up and actually get there. And you're just willing to go through all of the work because once you get there, you know, I can kick my feet up and relax unless you got young kids at the beach. (laughs) Because then you're (laughs) hypervigilant. You know, but on most cases, you're just looking forward to the relaxation because you've gotten there. You've arrived. That's your destination. And you want to just relax. That's not obedience, though. Obedience is less like a vacation and more like war. The enemy's there. We got to go, but we got to do a lot of hard work and training to get there. It is hard. Getting our bodies prepared, right? That's hard work, like setting your heart. And once you get there, then you're at war. Hypervigilant. The work only increases. The effort only has to increase. That's what's happening here. Now that you are, have become a God-fearing, obedient people, then you still have to set your heart. Give attention to the inner man so that it can properly continue in God-fearing obedience. And when he calls them to set their heart, I do think that the details actually support them doing this. So they're given considerations. They're told essentially, and this is the, you know, smoothing out in the English translation, when they're told to set their heart, Most English translations uh, supply something like to consider, right? So he calls them to 
mental activity with the heart. Good reminder that your mental life takes place in your heart. Your heart is the, the primary place or uh, arena where your mental life takes place. Not your brain, although it's involved. It's a spiritual issue. What you think, what you feel, what you desire, what you know, what you believe, the psychologist cannot explain those things. The soul gives a suitable explanation for why you feel the way you do, why you think the way you do, why you believe the things you believe. Do you have a heart that's inclined toward the Lord? Is your mind submitted to God's thoughts or not? And so when he directs their mental activity, he calls them to do something with the heart. And notice this verse 15 from this day onward. It's sort of a put a stake in the ground here. And the same thing applies in verse 18. From this day onward, from this day onward, set your heart to some things. So what are the considerations that he has in mind? Well, these considerations certainly would have been successful with, with thoughtfulness. They're called to give their attention in their mental life to some things. One of those things being what we find in verse 15. The duties you neglected is one way to, to think about this, verse 15. So the first thing he says, from before one stone was set on another in the temple. Sort of like God digging up, you know, the old stuff. That was, that was three months ago before we started rebuilding the temple. Why are you bringing that up, God? Well, it's because they need to set their heart on that. I want you to think about this. There was a time when you neglected the duty of rebuilding the temple. I know you're doing it now, and that is good. Think about when you weren't doing that. From before one stone was set, set on another in the temple of the Lord. And not only consider the duties you neglected, but also con consider the difficulty you experienced. Verse 16, from when it was that one came to a grain heap of 20 measures, then there would only be 10. And from when one came to the wine vat to draw 50 troughs full, and there would only be 20. Oh yeah, that's right. What went along with our disobedience when we perverted our priorities and established our own earthly comforts above God's priorities. I want you to remember not only when that was, but remember how hard it was, the difficulty. You couldn't get enough to eat. You couldn't stay warm. You couldn't get enough to drink. And that's all what he reminds them of in chapter 1, verse 9. You looked for much, but behold, it comes to little. You bring it home. You, I blow it away. Verse 19, I call for a drought on the land, on the mountains, on the grain, on the new wine, on the oil, on what the ground brought forth, men, cattle, all the labors of your hands. You remember that? Yeah. It was not easy. It was hard kicking against the goads, as it were, working against God. And so God wants them to remember this, the duties you neglected, the difficulty you experienced, even Verse 17, he wants them to consider the God who was opposing them. I struck you and every work of your hands. So he, he, God puts himself on the hook. I want you to remember that I was the one doing it. Struck you every work of your hands with scorching wind, mildew, hail, Again, just to remind us, Deuteronomy 28, these are things that were specifically outlined as the curses of disobedience. And then he adds to this list of things to remember. I want you to remember the stubbornness you displayed, yet you did not come back to me, declares the Lord. Remember the duties you neglected, the difficulty you experienced, the God who opposed you, the stubbornness you displayed,
And then in the mix of this things to remember, we get the command, verse 18, set your heart to consider from this day onward. Verse 18 ends, set your heart to consider. And then verse 19. So what else is he telling them to consider? He's telling them to also not just stop there with the things you neglected, experienced, that I oppose you, your own stubbornness, but now, finally, in that thought process with the God who blesses you. Yet from this day on, verse 19 ends, I will bless you. You know, this was during the, the season when the seeds are in the ground, and so now they're wanting to know, they're waiting, what's this year going to be like? They're wanting to know. They don't know. What's going to be the result? Is it going to be like it has been the past several years? Are we going to look for much and bring in little? Is the scorching wind, mildew, hail going to continue? And this is God's way of saying no. Now that you've become an obedient, God-fearing people, you have my blessing. I mean, this, this, what we're, what we're looking at in the, in the end of this section deserves a, a whole sermon or series on its own. But just what does godly introspection involve? Godly introspection. Uh, is it just morbid? Oh, I'm such a sinner. I can never please God. Woe is me. All doom and gloom. I just can never get it right, come Lord Jesus, so I can be done with sin. No, that's actually not godly introspection. Godly introspection takes the full counsel of God, embraces the exhortations, warnings, rebukes, admonitions of God, as well as God's gospel, good word, blessings, encouragements, and comforts. I mean, Haggai's doing that for his audience. God is doing that for this people through the prophet. I want you to call these things to mind. Just think if we applied what's here in principle. If you, Christian, considered life before Christ, the duties you neglected, the difficulty that you experienced before you knew Christ and that God was in opposition to you. Maybe some of you have real tangible, vivid memories of, yeah, I remember when that didn't work out. That was the Lord <laughs> protecting me or opposing me. I'm so thankful I didn't get what I wanted. I have those specific events in mind, things just weren't working out. Why? Man, the Lord was chastening me and protecting me from myself as an unbeliever. And then as a believer, I can see times when the Lord's discipline is coming to my life. To, to consider those things is no detriment to the Christian so long as he comes full circle and he remembers where he currently stands with Christ. But God, but, but Christ rescued me. But Christ is my shepherd today, ever guiding me, overseeing all of my actions providentially, overseeing my Christ-likeness and progress in it, caring for his church corporately, ruling among us. Those are comforting thoughts that in your godly introspection, if you practice godly introspection, you will not neglect to remember. And so this section where God articulates his promise to his people all ends with his commitment to them. Yet from this day, as you wait for the crops, the seeds are out of the barn, 
things are in the ground and you're waiting for the vines, fig tree, pomegranate, olive trees, all of these things to produce, I'm going to tell you before they produce so that you know when they produce, it was me, I'm going to bless you. And so this is why we find just at ending this section in verse 18, he specifically calls to mind the date again, this very day, 24th day of the ninth month, from the day when the temple of the Lord was, and probably better translated, built, right? It's already, the foundation's already been laid. The idea is when you're doing the building, I want you from this day to know this in your heart. It's me who's, set, who's determined to bless you. And so people believing this word from God didn't have to wait long to see the fulfillment of it. Here come the crops. Now when we go and look for much, we bring in much. And so this is God's promise to his people. This would have been an incredible encouragement to the people to press on. And the second word, the second part of this final word from Haggai that strengthens God's people is specifically his plan for Zerubbabel. His plan for Zerubbabel. Look at verse 20. Just like verse 10, this again comes with the arrival of the word. When the word of the Lord came to a second time, then the word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai, on the 24th day of the, of the month, and then the word of the Lord speaks. Everything that we said before, the bibliology embedded there all applies. But now it says, speak specifically, verse 21, to Zerubbabel. To Zerubbabel. The govern, he's the governor of Judah. And what God lays out in the concluding verses of the prophecy all pertain to the future. His plan for Zerubbabel includes the annihilation of the world and the appointment of Zerubbabel. Both these things are here. The annihilation of the world and the appointment of Zerubbabel. It is broadly agreed upon by commentators that this is a uh, a word about the future uh, pertaining to the, the eschaton or the last days. And that's right. It's clear from the details. He reminds us in verse 21 that part of this last day, this eschaton that's coming, is the annihilation of the world. And he says, I am going to shake or literally make the heavens and the earth shake. He's going to be the one to cause this. God is. And if you remember just from last week, we saw this same thing in verse 6, where he says, once more in a little while, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also, and the dry land. And I will also shake, verse 7, the nations, and they will all come with the desirable things of all the nations. I'll fill the house with glory. And so he's calling this time to mind again. He's reminding Zerubbabel specifically, this is what's in store. A massive um, shaking of things as they are so that it could be said that there's a removal of the things current. The way things seem now, nothing's going to look the same. So great is this shaking. That applies to the earth and the heavens. This is not metaphorical. It's literal. When this happens, verse 22 says, God will be, what will he be doing? This is not only violence done to creation, right, the heavens and the earth, but this is violence done to kingdoms. I will overthrow the thrones of kingdoms and destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations, and I will overthrow the chariots and their riders, and the horses and their riders will go down, everyone by the sword of another. 
So at this time, on this day, when this shaking happens, there's going to be an overthrow of every earthly government, every earthly power, and what makes them strong, right? The, the thrones, the seats of power, as well as their strength, the things that keep them in power, chariots, riders, horses, riders. They'll all go down, everyone by the sword of another. There were instances in Scripture when God turned the enemy nations against each other so that Israel would prevail. I think something like that is in view. And so on this last day, when this shaking occurs, there will also be the overthrow of nations, the killing one army of another, so that there are no more earthly powers. They've all been done away with, as well as the enemies of Israel, I think is the the implication, because notice on that same day, verse 23, who rises up? Who remains? Zerubbabel. No other earthly power, but here you have a an earthly power of some sort. He's a governor under Persian rule, of course, but he remains. And he says, God says of him, on that day, so we're still talking about the same day. If you were here when we studied Zephaniah in evening services, you'll remember that the the day of the Lord had two phases. (laughs) There was universal destruction first, to then be followed by unparalleled blessing. It's not stated that way here, but you do get the same descriptions. Destruction followed by, at least in this case, one blessed man, right? He doesn't clearly experience the destruction followed by the, the killing of the earthly powers But it's on that day, declares Yahweh of hosts, when he takes Zerubbabel, again, same man, son of Shealtiel, my servant, declares Yahweh, and he takes him and makes him like a seal, or what's called a signet ring. This would have been the ring um, that belonged to, to the king, only worn by him, because it was official. If you find that seal on anything, then it is a word from the king. And so the, the signet ring bore the emblem, the exact stamp or imprint of the ruler himself. The ring isn't Zerubbabel's ring. But the idea is that God makes Zerubbabel, who is his servant, Yahweh's servant, like that seal. In other words, as as one commentator says, as the servant of Yahweh, Zerubbabel, will be chosen to serve as a signet, that is, as a seal, whose purpose is to reflect and represent the person whose name it bears. Zerubbabel, like a seal inscription, will be the instrument of Yahweh, who will serve as his vice regent, on the earth and attest to his ownership of it upon all which he places his signature. The point is Zerubbabel will have here, God is ensuring him, because he was faithful in this current season, God would secure his place in some sort of ruling capacity in his kingdom plan. One man, Zerubbabel. And you'll remember, this, this shouldn't be strange that one man would play a, a role, an enduring role in the kingdom, even with delegated authority to rule as a perfect representation of God the King because Jesus even told his apostles, New Testament, 12 thrones, they'll belong to the 12 apostles in your rule in the kingdom all under King Jesus, with no other earthly powers. 
And so Zerubbabel is one who fits this description. I will make you like a signet ring, not because you've earned it, not because of your perfect obedience in the here and now, but because I have chosen you. And so here we see Zerubbabel's reward eclipses his obedience. His obedience was not commensurate to the reward, the blessing that came, and neither was the people's. Again, they're building a temple that lacks glory. It lacks the glory of Solomon, and both this temple of Zerubbabel and the temple of Solomon will lack the glory of the temple that's coming, but God blesses anyway. How lavish are his gifts when he gives them. And the same thing is true of you, Christian. God's rewards will far surpass your obedience. Your obedience won't hold a candle to the rewards you receive when you finally enter into the kingdom, when the kingdom finally comes and rewards are given out. And so what? So obey. Obey. The, the treasure you're storing up in heaven far surpasses your obedience in the here and now. And so you can obey. You can endure suffering. You can endure scorn. You can do the hard things. Why? A kingdom's coming, and you will be rewarded beyond your wildest dreams. I'm convinced that when God rewards his faithful saints, we will only wish that we had been more faithful. And so be faithful in the here and now. Whatever God's called you to, no obedience, no task of faithfulness is too small. You can trust the Lord. You can obey him and practice God-fearing obedience. Let's pray. God, to what could we say that would adequately express our gratitude, the, the gratitude that you are owed, nothing, nothing. The best we can do is believe you and do what you ask and to run into the lives of everyone who does not know you, who is doomed for hell rather than the kingdom that is coming and warn them and urge them to press into the kingdom, to lay hold of these promises because they are so good and so undeserved and because you are a God who is gracious to give and give and give of yourself, then all people should believe you and worship you as you have called them to. Make us a people who fits that description so that we have hope in this life, so that we are those who tell others of this hope that we have. And God, help us to link arms all together at Grace Bible Church and help one another to press eagerly into the kingdom, even as we prioritize seeking your kingdom and your righteousness as we wait for all these other things, these lesser things to be added to us. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.